Okay, thank you. Uh, thank uh, Robert for his uh, persistence and Sandra for their persistence over the years in this very admirable effort. Uh, I'm a string theorist and usually, and I hope John will attest to that, I give talks which are built on irrefutable logic. Uh, in, th in this case, uh, the talk comes from a different place. Uh, the talk is of a more emotional because this is something in which I am emotionally involved. And I want to describe to you the journey of uh, where the discovery is not known a priori, where the scientists of the, of the region have, I think, took their governments to places where they never thought they would reach. And definitely, if they had a meeting a priori about it, this would have never, never happened. So this is a case which I think, especially for the younger people in the audience, uh, it tells you that when one makes a big effort, one can make some difference. And I encourage you uh, uh, to think about it. So the scientific uh, part, which I will hardly touch upon, even though I will say how important it is, is building an accelerator, but not of the magnitude that you have seen here. The, this accelerator is a light source. Uh, electrons are going around uh, this machine. When they're accelerated, they emit light. And uh, the, the building is not 27 kilometers in circumference, but 75 meters by 75 meters. There's not only one in the world. There are the order of 70 in the world. So this is the general uh, scientific framework. but as I will describe, very high quality science can be done on such a machine. This is something okay. I'd like to leave to next generation. I want to you to listen to this first. It has to work because it means a better world. It means a better world from many uh, aspects um, in terms of bringing science here, in terms of bringing uh, a line of communication. Maybe it will not bring peace to the region. It is very valuable and it is very important for our region because we can, one country cannot afford uh, to have a uh, single uh, synchrotron machine. Here we are as scientists and scientists usually belong to the humanity, not to the country. I understand that there are some political use of science, but we are not here for political use of science, we are here for science. The work we do here can be used in many fields, including electronics, including engineering, including material science. So it will have many applications from cement to health. What we hope is that science will open the door to, uh, for uh, other or further understandings concerning other issues. Okay? This is what we hope. I mean, we begin with science and somehow we will open the doors that are closed for years or for centuries. In Iranian and Palestinians and Pakistanians, scientists are my friends because they are scientists, so we have a common ground. The common ground is doing research. We don't care about what is your religion, what is the color of your skin, we don't care about that. We only care about science. In science, there is no hostile, okay? We are scientists, we are academic people. We, we are not dealing on political issues. I think uh, Sesame is a mm, modern technology uh, which uh, helps to people around the Middle East uh, to develop and improve their knowledge. I imagine a war would bring it to a stop, but we've been pretty close to the, uh, a war, a very, very high tension level in the last few years, and somehow we've managed to keep going. It was always my dream that to show that Arabs and Israelis can work together for the benefit of humanity and for the benefit of their own people. Both sides having an interest in that. And for me, Sesame, in a way, is an incarnation of such a dream. Okay, so I wanted uh, to bring this to you because for me, this is already achieving, if you wish, on a Freddy program some midterm goal, namely the fact that one could have had, and this is unstaged, this is, uh, they are not reading scripts. So the fact that people from such diverse countries, which actually several are declared enemies of each other, have succeeded to reach a situation where they speak in this language is to me an extremely uh, strong 
and powerful message, which I think is very important. And now, as I said, I will describe a little bit in a more emotional way and in a more Israeli way, this will be my very personal point of view of, what, of how this happened, what were the type of obstacles one had to cover, to overcome, and how this thing evolved and where, this, where it is actually right now. And for this, I need my presentation. Okay, so uh, one, one point of view is uh, John, myself, many other scientists are thinking about this next Copernican revolution where there are many universes. Not just that the Earth or the cave is not our center of our life, uh, but we would all love to live in them. And I say that when I go to Sesame, I live in a parallel universe because I live in a universe where people are working together for a common goal. And the politics and what you read in the newspapers is sometimes, but very rarely, permeating into what we do together. And as I said, this is very personal. So I described to you what the, the, in gross terms that this is a light source, and I want to tell you what is unique about it. So I think what is first unique about it is its robustness. This has, go, has been going on for about 20 years now. And if you think of ups and downs that our region has passed in 20 years, the fact that we are still sticking together, I think is an amazing, shows the amazing common will which we have. Then the scientists involved, and I'm not a synchrotron radiation machine, so I'm not testifying here about myself, are very high quality. We are trying to achieve very high quality science, and I will describe to you in what sense that's an obstacle to us and we are, why we insist on that. And then going again to the beginning, I think one has shown enormous dedication. And I think it's very difficult to find something scientific on a parallel uh, view. I, Tamimi and Tal, I salute for what they are doing on water. It has an immediate and very important impact, but I think on a, on a scientific level, I don't think if you look at what nations are involved, it's not, not simple to find something like this. Here I, I drew the names of some Israeli scientific scientists which are involved. I, above the line are the people who understand less about synchrotron radiation, definitely me, and below are those which do definitely understand about synchrotron radiation. And in particular, we discuss gender. So Ada Yonat, as you know, is the first woman to have received the Nobel Prize in chemistry. And for her, the project is also uh, very important. Now, CERN was uh, built, as was described briefly, uh, or let's say part of its goals were to heal Europe after World War II. Uh, we, in our region, are in a different situation in the sense that the war in Europe is over and it's clear who won and who lost. In our region, the rules are not totally clear. Not everybody agrees who won and who lost. And nevertheless, we are together trying to take, to serve as a bridge for understanding, using science as a bridge. I don't believe scientists are any better humanly than other people. They are, they are egocentric. They, they have all the faults and the qualities that other people have. However, we do have somehow the neck of collaboration. And I think given that neck of collaboration, we should do the best that we can to make such projects succeed. It's not obvious we will succeed. We may or we may not. But we should make the utmost effort to do it. And if you want to be involved in such projects, you have to stop reading the newspapers. You can't hear the news on what's happening every day. You have to be an eternal optimist because the fluctuations in the real news are enormous and you need to believe that you are somehow living on an upward curve. Now, the first big dis uh, decision, which is not necessarily related to our region, is when you want to build a joint scientific collaboration, how should it be done? Should it be done in a top-bottom approach, namely the people or other of this nature above will tell you what, the bu what their budget is and what are the important subjects for society to deal with? And then you at the bottom just, if you're interested, execute. If you're not interested, too bad. Or maybe you, you yourself come with what is important and convince the people above that they should do what you would like them to do. 
Now, I must say that myself, I'm a bottom-top person. And I think that it's the scientists which should come and tell the politicians and try to convince them what is important to do. Okay, now, in the Middle East, it's not so easy to do it. And what comes together with this is do you do small science for collaboration or do you do big science? That's another dilemma. Now, I, as I personally very, I hate very much to compromise, but in this case, I did compromise and I agreed after some experience that we have to do here the top-bottom approach. It's impossible in our area to do a collaboration without a political umbrella. Not just the money, just the political umbrella. But there is one thing which we are not allowed to compromise, and that is to do good science. I think to do a mediocre scientific collaboration, it's better not to touch it. Don't do it. If you do it, you have to do it so it will attract good scientists. It won't be the best machine in the world. We don't have the possibility for that. But it should be good enough so that world-class scientists will be interested for their own selfish reasons to do their science. And as you will see, this is a, will play a crucial role in our decision process and in, in actually in the history as it evolved. So for me, this started uh, at the 61st uh, birthday of the late uh, Sergio Fubini, who was a person at CERN. And in the corridors of CERN, one day he came to me and said, you are a leftist idealist, which I don't think I'm neither leftist nor idealist, but this is how he characterized me. The Oslo agreements, which are now vilified, are there. Let's try and do something in the region. And he uh, gave me two tasks in a meeting, which I remember very well, that also John was there in Torino. Uh, he asked me to give a mini review of uh, new aspects of string theory, which I'm, I think are very interesting, actually, what I've written. But he also told me to research Arab-Israeli scientific collaboration. So I did that. I gave both talks. And my conclusion after discussing with many people, most of them in Israel, telling me there is no chance re really for a collaboration, was actually the opposite. That if you find a project where both sides have something to contribute, where the project cannot go on without both sides being involved, this is something which is worthwhile to try. And w this was the conclusion, I don't know if John remembers it, but that was the conclusion of that lecture. Armed with this knowledge, we went to Egypt, uh, actually, entrepreneurs, uh, Sergio Fubini, myself, and uh, Alberto Devoto, we met with Egyptian officials and we signed an agreement because we were told that Mubarak, the disposed president of Egypt, has decided to take politics out of scientific relations. And that was true for a while, so we enjoyed that lull and we were able uh, to do such a thing. So we signed an agreement, more or less at this stage, entrepreneurial. And nobody really represented anything. It was just the goodwill, except the Egyptians, which did represent the government. Then it came about that an Egyptian delegation visited uh, Jerusalem. You see, I was much younger then. And the important person to notice here is Sergio uh, uh, Fubini. And we actually came that in a stage which Sandra is very familiar with. There came the issue of per diem. Uh, who will pay uh, per diem for the Egyptians? We can't take it out of our research contracts. They don't have their money. So Sergio Fubini suggested very gallantly to take out his, he took out his checkbook and said, I will pay. So I told him, I'm very glad you have a certain salary. I have an Israeli salary. We can't base uh, something on that. So what do you do at this stage? At this stage, you need friends. And the friend we had at the time was uh, Miguel Virasoro, a very well-known scientist who was head of ICTP in Italy at the time. He, on a phone call, at the, on a, in one minute, decided to give us enough money uh, to go ahead with the project. Now, we sat together and we, we made a meeting in Egypt which had three levels. It had senior people, it had mid-career people, and it had very young people. And it had it from all involved in the process, Arabs and Israelis. Now, you can't read here but this is, here it says physics in Hebrew, here in Arabic, here in Italian, here in English. And the, the university supporting here, you would see, is Amman, Cairo, Bethlehem, uh, uh, Israel. You can read on the side, you can see Jerusalem, Cairo, Cairo, INFN, 
Trieste, uh, etc., etc. So this was really a very special type of, of project. We met together, uh, sorry, in a Bedouin tent. We had a magnitude 7 earthquake, so the Mount Sinai really sh shook. So everybody had a, a very good ambience, and we really thought that this thing is going to work very well. People from all over the world supported. There were Nobel laureates in the past, and people which got high awards afterwards. It appeared at the Seren Courier. You see here Sergio Fubini. You see the ministers of, educa of higher education in Egypt. And you see the head of the Israeli academy, which invented the dot zip. If you ever use dot zip uh, in your communications, he's the person who invented it. We did there what one usually does. One signed an agreement. I should also add that even though I was characterized by Sergio as a leftist idealist, uh, uh, I had neighbors. We live in Jerusalem, mostly in apartment buildings. And the neighbors uh, who heard about what I was doing were supplying me information. Uh, so I'm keeping up to date uh, what's going on uh, around me. And I must say, it's true, the Egyptian press at that period, and not only that period, can be very anti-Semitic. Now, doing all of that, we were on, on a high, but then it turned out that uh, Mubarak decided to bring back politics into science because there was a big eruption between Israel and Lebanon at the time. There were hundreds of people killed. And it was impossible to work anymore in the region. So the great meeting we had, we had to make an undignified retreat. And the undignified retreat was Torino, Italy. And there we thought, what would be a good thing to do? So we thought one thing, as you heard now from in the report of Philippe and the work of John and Robert, is to bring uh, Palestinians to work in, and Israelis to work together at CERN. But we were also thinking about synchrotron radiation. And this was presented at this meeting by Gus Voss, by now the late Gus Voss, who said that uh, he and Herma Vinnick had an idea uh, to bring a, a, a machine in Germany which is dismissed, and uh, this, uh, this will be this junk, and why don't we bring it to the Middle East? Now, it had one enormous appeal. There, you, as I said, you need a critical mass of people who can really enjoy it. It must be good science. And synchrotron radiation machines have a very large cross-section. You can do medicine in them. You can do environmental science. Had they not gotten such a machine, the Nobel Prize in biology for looking at proton structure. You can do material science. You can do archaeology. It, it, you can build the critical mass of researchers in the Middle East uh, to do it. But should we take the machine or not? What do you say? I told you we have to do good science. Can you take a jump? Okay, so we deliberated a lot about that, and then our decision was that because it's so complicated to arrange all these different countries, and have been Iran and Germany as well, to have to have Pakistan, to have them work together, that we first use a machine for one purpose, to build the administrative structure around it. And then, after we have the administrative structure, we are going to have to to build a new machine on this and the, the, the nucleus, some small nucleus. And this is what we did. We went to Uppsala. At this stage, Herbert Chopper became a key activist in, in this uh, process. And from Jordan came uh, Khaled Khan, who was at that stage the Minister of Education in Jordan. We, we had many, many So at, at that stage, many things happened. We went uh, to UNESCO in Paris. That was less pleasant politically, but it, it enabled us to establish all what was going on. And the first major decision we had to do is where, where to make it. There were many countries which, which were interested to do it. Armenia put a suggestion, Cyprus put, Egypt put, Iran put a suggestion. Israel could not put a suggestion because it's not realistic. The Arab Iranian scientists would not come to Israel. So even if we have the technical capability, it didn't make sense for us uh, to ask that he's there. At the end, uh, we decided in Amman to do it in, in Jordan. That, that was, let's say, the political level decision, which was brought afterwards to, uh, to voting. 
And it was in a place where, from the Israeli point of view, you could reach from the Weizmann Institute in two and a half hours, which would be an attraction if it's a good machine. This is the site. And I am showing you the transparency of the dream. I mean, many of you here. Okay, nobody was worried, so they <laughs> fell asleep. Okay, so the, uh, I was saying that the decision was to do it in Jordan, and uh, the, I'm showing you now the original uh, slides from what w at the time was just a dream. So these are the pictures of the place, and these are the plans. This is again the picture. We approved it at CERN, the meeting was. It was jo uh, CERN was... Uh, at CERN, we decided it would be in Germany. We began to select uh, places where people would get uh, training. Then uh, Jordan agreed to fully do the construction. We had various people uh, available to help us. And politically, what happened is that UNESCO officially accepted Sesame as a body. And this was very important because, let's say, Pakistan and Israel have no diplomatic relations. So the only way that they can have an agreement between them is that each of them deposits its instruments at UNESCO. And this is the way CERN was also made originally. All the instruments were deposited actually at UNESCO. Okay, then uh, we took the German machine. The German machine is a very interesting story which will tell you the iceberg of how these things work. Uh, the Japanese uh, wanted Matsura, uh, Professor Matsura, to be elected as Director General of UNESCO. I, didn't know, I don't know if you know, but you, when you are a director general, you come with a dowry. I don't know if Carlo came with a dowry when he was elected DG of CERN, but at UNESCO you have to come with a dowry. And that, that part of that dowry, he gave scientists in Novosibirsk to go to Berlin to dismantle the synchrotron in Berlin, pack it in what I call Lego pieces, write, put one into two and two into three, etc put it somewhere in the Jordanian desert so no harm, the dryness would keep it so no harm happens to it, so that we have a nucleus around which we can build the organization. And here you see the king of Jordan, he was in the inauguration uh, of the place. The members, I write Bahrain, but in the recent years Bahrain has not really uh, participated. There are Cyprus, Egypt, Israel, Jordan, Pakistan, Palestinian, sorry, Turkey and Iran. So you notice that Cyprus and Turkey are together. This is the uh, Greek part of Cyprus. Then came the plans of the real machine we wanted uh, to build. Uh, these were the plans of where to house it. And these, as I said, are the original plans. All It's easy to do on a computer, but can you really do it on the place? And gradually, yes, th this is the Palestinian Rafik Sarraf, which built the place. He had a lot of experience of construction in Saudi Arabia. Then gradually, this was built, built, and here is already the building uh, in much more detail. Now, we have in, uh, in physics, uh, we believe a dogma related to black holes, which is called holography which says that all the information sits on the boundary and you can reconstruct everything in the bulk. Now, of course, if that would be true for the building at the time, that's great because we had the shell and we didn't have anything inside. So the, why didn't we have anything inside? Because we didn't want to use a German machine for the synchrotron. We needed money to buy a new machine, essentially. And that was a major obstacle. At that stage, Chris Llewellyn Smith, another ex-director of CERN joined the process. I brought this because th this is the, the leading television uh, uh, announcer in Israel. And this is the leading TV channel. So eventually, one, su I su one succeeded to bring them, and I think it was very important for the Israeli population just to see that such a thing can happen. Because when you are in the middle of the crisis, you don't really believe it. So these are the three main channels and this is each of them announcing uh, the project. So the project did get, uh, get, did get uh, publicity in Israel, and that helped, because at a certain stage, the, pro the project seemed to be on the brink of doing nothing. And then, I should say, it was the Israeli suggestion uh, that Israel will pay $5 million for a capital fund if other countries would be willing to join as well. So not just membership fees, but really to help us buy a new machine. 
Israel did it. We had a meeting in Jordan with all members of the... Uh, you told me that you know Salman? You see him? Yeah, he, this is Salman Salman from uh, Palestinian. And we signed an agreement where Iran, Israel, Turkey, and Jordan, the usual bedfellows in the Middle East, each gives $5 million uh, for the project. And Egypt, actually, till the day before yesterday, is all the time saying the moment they get out of their problems, they have passed in the government a decision to also add their $5 million. This impressed CERN, and Europe, which was very resistant to give real money to CERN, was impressed by, by when the director general of CERN, Rolf Hoye, tried once again. Again, it was maybe a little more personal. So they made a very roundabout deal. They gave money uh, from Brussels to CERN to build magnets for Sesame together with people f which come from the region, which should learn how to build and how to make specifications of the magnet, Jean-Pierre, on his head, uh, the yoke of, uh, of building this. And he reports that this will be ready next year, so that part would be completely full. The Norwegians have contributed a certain sum. It is not large, so I'd, I'm ashamed for them to say how much it is. But Italy, on the other hand, the INFN has given him, him last year one million, euro this year another million euro and is saying that if it will go well it will give another three million euro so from the point of view of money there is money to re to begin to reconstruct the machine it gets full it gets fuller and today there is a whole structure uh, i'm showing it to you not to test you afterwards but just to see there is an ad a logical administrative structure to the place and from the point of view of the money promised Jordan has already given two million instead of two and a half, which it promised. Israel has given two and a half. Turkey has given two and a half. Iran, th the sanctions are very effective. So Iran really has difficulties to transmit the money, but they've promised once again the day before yesterday that they are now bringing it to the five plus one, which allowed them an exemption of eight, million, eight billion dollars. They asked that this be one of the things on the list which would be ex uh, exempted and would be allowed uh, to use it. Okay, this is a budget, so people are paying real money every year for this. Now, we like to say that we are like CERN. CERN had a major crisis, and the major crisis, as you know, was because of a welding on, a, on an extension which is about that large. And so we also had a major crisis because of snow, which suddenly fell in the desert, and it fell to a quantity which it destroyed the roof. Uh, so. This is going to be, in October, it's going to be uh, reconstructed. This, there is an initial program. On day one, I think either two or three beam lines will work. The, I'm going to flash this fast because we are making this for the people. And these are the people all over the region which have stated that they are interested to work in Sesame and have participated, hundreds have participated in our user meetings. And for them, as you heard in the TV program, it is extremely important for Sesame uh, that it really works. So I think we are, I don't want to say dates, because in the Middle East dates always go like sand. But I think in, the, in about two years, we will be in a stage where beams will be already installed there. And then it will be our real test, forgetting raising money, forgetting raising uh, uh, polis, uh, politics, but really, one will need to build a machine which functions 90 or 95 percent of the time and works at a very high quality, so good scientists will be interested in it. Uh, it also has, it's, the, the realistic world is complicated, it's not a simple thing uh, uh, to do and this gives you a little bit of the feeling of, of what is needed for such a thing to work. But, and there's very little tourism, if you want to join, by the way. The only time I could visit Petra out of my many visits in Jordan is when the meeting was in Petra. So don't join such efforts if you expect tourism. I started with such a picture, I end with such a picture. I asked the experimentalist here to identify what it is. Okay, so what it really is, is one person, it's about people, one person here, using iron on which cement will be poured, we are near an earthquake region, so to have a very stable floor for the place. So this is what it is, it's one person. And the general background is black, that's my region. 
But you see there are shades of white, actually, not of gray here. Shades of white uh, here. And I think that we are bringing some shades of white. So, obrigado. Thank you uh, very much, uh, Eliezer, for bringing us up to date on this really very exciting project. So we have time for a couple of questions. So I don't see any immediately. You wanted to, you wanted to ask? Yes, please. And uh, about the power needed to run the machine. Will do you get the, the power? The, the, it's part of the site arrangement. Is the Jordan has to supply the power and it has to be stable. Now, when we originally started this, Jordan was supplied by Iraq, by oil, at a very cheap prices. And since then, many things have happened in our region. The Arab Spring was mentioned in various occasions here. And at this stage, actually, the prices of oil are going high up in Jordan, and it's, be it's, it's becoming a major exposure, as a businessman would say, in our, in our budget. So when we commit for the budget for the next three years, it's up to fluctuations in the power, in the power cost. There is a suggestion, which I don't know how serious this is, that actually to use European money for solar energy, and maybe the region has solar energy, maybe we can reduce our reliance, but it's, I'm not sure it's a significant enough percentage that it makes the effort worthwhile. Yes, Carlo. Hello. Yes, first of all, let me congratulate with you and all the people for this, uh, this work. This is a very important uh, activity. It's been going on, as you say, for so many years with great support. Several people, outstanding people who contributed. I think about Shopper, for instance, is one of the person initially did that. Everybody tried to help. Fubini also is another one, a very important person in the past. Now, the question is, to run the experiment like this, you only also not only need the machine, but you also need the cool instrumentation. And how are you going to do with this instrumentation for the beam lines? The beam lines are complicated, they're expensive. They cost roughly 10 million euro each. That's a kind of order of 4 million, you can do it in four. But then you need it four or five, so you need some 20 million. And this is, a, is that already being planned or do you still need to have some help for that? So uh, first, there are several ingredients. It's an excellent question, and there are several ingredients about the beam lines. I didn't have time to, uh, to address it. So some countries have already put aside money to, to be in the beam lines. We got equipment from many labs in the world. There's really, it's heartwarming to see how many people support it, but it's old, it's old equipment, so we don't know. Some, a magnet can be as old as it, you want and will work. Other optics may have been spoiled in the process, so we'll find out how much, I think we, the estimated value of this is around $15 million of value, but I don't know what the real value is. Yes, we are giving it very serious thought, and now that the machine, the accelerator itself is being built, in parallel we are working on two to three beam lines and, and having the funding. But if the question meant, can you help, the answer is yes. <laughs> okay, uh, that's the last question from Gago. Well, Eliezer, uh, uh, that's an extraordinary, uh, an extraordinary story, and uh, and told by you, one one uh, 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 recalls that uh, uh, once a famous novelist said that that the best reality is the one that no one will believe except if it is fiction, and and in fact, what I would like to ask you uh, uh, from this story, which is. Uh, very improbable from a human and political point of view is um, how did your colleagues in uh, Israel from the very beginning react it? How have you built your own constituency around you in your own country? Because uh, that's clear there is certainly a secret in there. And that secret has to do of course with uh, personality, with trust uh, trust around the main players, 
It has to do with uh, a process that was launched by the Oslo agreements, without, probably without that revolution of hope that uh, after some years faded, but without that, that would have been impossible. I mean, we would, you wouldn't be uh, uh, psychologically convinced and other people would not be convinced to go into their area. But um, it, it must be extraordinarily difficult, because if it was not extraordinarily difficult, we would have had many uh, ventures like that, scientific ventures for peace around the world, and we don't have. War, yes, we have, many places, uh, but we don't have uh, organizations or scientific ventures for peace successful around the world. So it, it, experimentally, I would say it, is, it was almost impossible to do it. Now, let me just uh, ask you one single question. Your own constituency, the people you had to convince in your own country uh, to, 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 to make it go. Because after all, you, you have been extremely successful in doing that uh, as a scientist. Is, is, and it is one of the most marvelous examples of a, of a scientist acting in science policy in a very, very difficult and dangerous uh, uh, environment. Okay, thanks for the kind words which I take for all our organization, on behalf of all our organization, all of the people very dedicated in their own countries. Uh, in, I can, as, as far as Israel is concerned, as you know, it's not a secret, our country is essentially divided uh, on such issues, and sometimes one side gains and sometimes the other side gains. What I found is that uh, somehow the rule of sum, if, if I would be teaching a course, if there is an organization, and in that organization there is a person which can make decisions and is on the right side, which means my side in, in this case, th that he, he or she can actually make a difference. And I found this in the finance ministry, in the foreign ministry, in the academy of science, and between the, um, our, the scientific constituency. There was an argument, for example, people were saying you can, uh, sesame is a place to build atom bombs. A and we had to refute that. Uh, actually, that came out of Germany. It was a concerned German scientist who alerted the Israeli community to that. So there were big fights, and we are a, we are a divided country. It's not easy to do it, but you need some good people, and, it, and they help you work. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Eliezer.